Grace, mercy, and peace be to each of you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth, O Lord, and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. By the way, the missing of a song was a legitimate mistake. I wasn't trying to buy myself more time to preach here, uh, so... uh, On the occasion of the first of four celebrations, and let me just stop myself in the middle of my first sentence and say, man, uh, you long town Onians sure know how to celebrate and praise the goodness of God. And so we rejoice. But on the first of four celebrations of the 125th anniversary of this church, which to be clear, has nothing to do with the bricks and sticks put together in 1912, but rather you, the people of God in Christ Jesus. So on the 125th anniversary of this church, Zion Lutheran Church, I say this morning, good job. Actually, I'll take that back and I'm going to say great job, first and foremost, to our Lord God Almighty. God the Father, who is the reason we're here, who not only created the earth and everything in it, but created you individually, who put you together into this local gathering of his people in the scriptures week. That's the church. And we rejoice in God the Father today and say, good job, of course, good job and great job and high praise to the Son, Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be here without him and we certainly will not be there someday without him. And so we say, Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for taking our sin upon yourself and going to the cross and giving your life. And God, thank you for looking at that sacrifice of your son and saying, we're good. The price of sin, it's now paid. The debt's it's done. And let's be very clear, the Holy Spirit, I'm here to tell you this morning, this church wouldn't have survived 125 days, much less 125 years, if not for the Holy Spirit of our living God. Think about that. I mean, the Holy Spirit's been at work. I mean, bringing people to faith, strengthening you in your faith, comforting you when you've gone through hard times, helping you to follow Jesus and his word as closely as you possibly can. So great job to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Back when I attended this church some years ago, we used to say the Holy Ghost. So some things change, right? God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. But today, I also say good job to each and every one of you. Why? Because you love God. You love God's word. You love Jesus. You love grace and you love truth. And when I say you love God, we better just take a step back and say, well, how? How can you love God? Why can you love God? And let's be abundantly clear. It's not because you made the first move toward him. It's abundantly clear in scripture. He made the first move to you. In his son, Jesus. You see, God didn't tell you, clean up your act and then you come. You come to Zion Lutheran Church. You clean up your act. He moved towards you in his son, Jesus Christ. And so I also today say, good job, not only to God and to you, but to Zion Lutheran Church, to you and your families as you've built your lives and your eternity on what we're here to talk about today, the chief cornerstone. Not the ones out there that we're we're talking about today from 1912, that's important too, but the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. I bring you huge congratulations uh, and just greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at Living Hope Lutheran Church in Kennesaw, Georgia. They are so excited. I literally, even last night, got a few more emails from some of my members. And we just recently celebrated 25 years. And I got to tell you, like, we thought we were the cool kids. I mean, we we're like, we're 25 years. And so when I got this invitation, I go and I tell the people, I'm going to be gone in June. Uh, I, I'm going to preach at my home congregation and they're celebrating 125 years, and they were just blown away. The hardest part of it all was trying to convince them all that I'm not a charter member. I mean, literally, it's like, 
I mean, how old do I look? I mean, I know I'm not getting any younger, but my goodness. 1897, come on now. But for the first 10 years of my life, right inside these walls, and 86 yards that way, and 52 yards that way, I literally stopped yesterday and measured, that's probably a little weird, but I did. This is where I learned about Jesus Christ. Primarily in the home, three doors down, seven of us, family devotions multiple times a day. I remember my dad reading the scriptures to us, prayer four or five times a day together. And then we moved to Jackson when I was 10. There were seven of us, and then we grew to eight. This is irony. The only one who wasn't a part of Zion back then is now, so I find incredible uh, <laughs> humor in that. But for the first 10 years of my life, in this little triangle, I mean, this is where I found out there is a God who loves me, who gave his son when I wasn't worthy, when I didn't deserve it. He gave his son so that I could be forgiven of my sins and, and I would come. The guy in the blue shirt in the back, that was my seat right there. That's where I sat for 10 years. And I learned all about Jesus. Do you still sit in the same seats? Is that right, Lutherans? We like to do that, right? man, I learned about Jesus. And I just want to say thank you because it changed my life. And now, I mean, I've some decades have passed. We don't need to discuss how many. But anyway, uh, I've built my life, my marriage, my family, my ministry on those truths that I first learned in this place. And so, so exciting. But it's just, it's cool to be back. I mean, it's really amazing to be back and say, this is where I first just became securely anchored in the gospel. And this is where I found out Christ could be the cornerstone of my life. So thank you. And by the way, when I was here, that wasn't a new thing for Zion. At that point, this had been going on for 75 years already. Again, it's, it's been a while since I sat back in that seat. I, I didn't realize later till I was a dad, so I sat where the gentleman in the blue shirt is, and my dad sat next, next to me, and then once I had a kid, I realized my dad was separating me from the fold to keep me from doing shenanigans and me having to use more grace than I probably needed to, right? I think that was what happened back then, but, but it's so good to be back. I'm humbled and honored, and I can truly say I'm a walking example of the power of grace and the Holy Spirit because how does a squirrely little kid from the back row suddenly have the deep honor, and I consider it an honor to stand here today and proclaim the gospel of Jesus to you. Now, can I be honest with you? And before you say no, you're the ones who taught me to be honest, so I hope you're going to let me be honest. Uh, by the way, not only in these four walls, but across the, across the Highway 61, over in the basement of the parish hall where we had Sunday school. I now understand the kids have been promoted and they get to be on the main level. Uh, but by the way, who here, raise your hand, who all went to Sunday school in the basement of the parish hall? You went to Sunday school with me, didn't you, I think? Or, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, I love, so now they moved up. So here's the thing, I'll stay in my own lane. I always tell people, stay in your own lane. Uh, but I, I was sharing yesterday, I think you guys need to have Sunday school. At least one day, take a field trip to the basement and tell the current generation, this is where we learned about Jesus in the good old days. I mean, that's, that was a happening place over there. My goodness. But back to me being honest with you. Uh, what am I going to be honest about? When I was invited to come today, initially very honored, but I paused for just a second. You may say, well, why? Because I've lived enough years on planet Earth to know that sometimes these events can be all about the good old days, the glory days. And that's just not where our God lives. We have a God who lives in the future, right? And so I was very stoked when I heard your theme. Tell the next generation. But I have good news for you today in case you're like, well, where, where's he going? Today, we're going to talk about all three things. It may be one of the very few times in this world, I'm hoping I can please everyone here today, because we are going to talk about the past. My goodness, 125 years. Wow. And we're going to celebrate the present. It's a big deal. And then we're going to look ahead. We're going to forge ahead by God's grace to a great future. So what can we say about the past? Today is the anniversary. I think it's actually a couple days from now, but close enough. The closest Sunday 
to the laying of the physical cornerstone of this building in the year 1912. And I need to go back and tell my people I wasn't here for that either. Uh, but anyway, but far more important than the physical rocks that hold this place up has been the spiritual rock. Because Jesus Christ has been the cornerstone from day one, and he always will be. He's been faithful to you all these years. Psalm 100 says, God is good and his faithfulness continues what? Through all generations. And to that we say yes. And that's some good news, but the news gets even better because God didn't just lay the cornerstone of Zion. Scripture tells us uh, he laid the cornerstone of earth itself when Job was going through hard times and trying to figure things out and he's wrestling with God. God kind of comes back at Job in chapter 38. And listen to what he says. I love this. I always, when I read the scriptures, I picture like what's going on. Job's probably like, oh, what did I do here? But God says to Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations, Job? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? On what were its footings set? Who laid the cornerstone of the earth? And I picture Job saying, Oh, all right. Oh, no. What happened? The answer is God did that. That's who did that. And he's the reason this church began, and he's the reason this church has existed now for 125 years. That's the past. What can we say about the present? Jesus Christ is still the cornerstone of this ministry. And I'm going to jump to Ephesians 2. There were so many scriptures that talked about cornerstone, I can't cover them all. I'm going to do a few of them. Ephesians 2, it starts by saying this. You are fellow citizens, listen to this, this is important, with the saints and the members of the household of God. So this citizenship we share, and you share at Zion, uh, is kingdom citizenship. God created a whole new community in the New Testament, bringing Jews and Gentiles together. And the result is you're a child of God. You get all the rights and privileges, all the grace, all the forgiveness. You all get to go to heaven solely by the grace of God. And the, the other side of this, the hard truth is, right, there is no Zion. There is no body of Christ. There's no church and there's no hope if Jesus Christ is not the cornerstone. And that's why we, we rejoice that in fact, 125 years in, Christ is still the cornerstone. Jump ahead to verse 20. It says, uh, God's family is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. He's the one who brings it together, the connectivity, the integrity, the security of the whole thing. It's him. And he builds his eternal family. He, he holds all of us together. So you may say, well, that's cool. And I love that. But like, where do I fit in personally? Well, you fit in personally by your faith, by your baptism. But then God's not satisfied there. He says, I'm going to build all these individual living stones, the scripture calls you, into a, a church, a community. And it's why all of you matter to him. Everyone who's been a member of Zion, now your task is to tell the next generation, right? Because the reality is, when you look at all these passages that talk about Jesus being the chief cornerstone, it really gives us two options. Either he is going to be the, the cornerstone of your salvation and your eternity, or the scripture says you're going to stumble and trip and fall over him. What about the future? Christ can be the only cornerstone, the only hope of this church moving forward. We could today. You could say, we're cashing it in. I mean, 120, man, good job. Boy, man. Let's just call it good. We could make it all about us or we could do what the scripture says and tell the next generation. Tell them it's only Christ. And that's what I certainly encourage you to do today. That way, get this, in 2147, long after I hope all of us are in heaven talking about the good old days at Zion. In 2147, I pray in this place, Jesus Christ will still be preached as the true cornerstone. Whose job is it to tell the next generation? Each and every one of us, scripturally. I love the story of the mother who 
says her four-year-old son, Zachary, comes running out of his bathroom. He's just hysterical. The poor little fella's crying and screaming. And he's carrying his toothbrush, uh, which uh, he had dropped in the toilet. I, I'm sorry, no, he dropped it in the toilet. She goes in and fishes it out. I'm sorry, I messed up my own story. She goes in and fishes his toothbrush out of the toilet and tries to calm him down and console him. And she picks up the toothbrush that had been in the toilet and she throws it in the trash. And so she looks to him and he kind of starts calming down, but she can tell his four-year-old wheels are turning and she's kind of intrigued by it. And all of a sudden he runs off and he runs into her bathroom and he comes back moments later with her toothbrush and says, uh, mommy, we better throw this one in the trash too, because a few days ago I dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> now, now, First of all, some of you are going to say, did we not teach this man better? I mean, we're about to go have lunch and you tell me that story. But I will say this. When I heard that story, I thought, my goodness, it is important to have information as early as you possibly can get it in life, right? I mean, if my toothbrush has been in the toilet, let me know right away, right? But I think this topic is too. We've got to know it as soon as possible. Not only that God calls us by the gospel, that he brings us into a relationship with Jesus, but that he selects each and every one of us to be on his save the world team. We, we proclaim the gospel. First Peter 2 is another place we hear a lot of this teaching of the cornerstone. And I can't do it all. There's so much there. In fact, I encourage you to read it on your own time. But I'm going to pick up in verse 9 where the scripture says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now that covers who we are as the people of God. What's our job? He goes on, he says, so that, right? You may declare the deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, as members of Zion, you all have a stake in the family business. Well, John, what's the family business? Jesus told us to seek and to save the lost. And if you're like me, you sit back and say, wow, like that's a humble but amazing task. I, I'm, I should be privileged to have this responsibility to share Jesus Christ wherever I can. You have this chance individually and as a church, to proclaim to this community, Jesus Christ changed my eternity. I believe in him. He has forgiven me all my sins. I, I will be in heaven someday because of him. You see, all of us who know the story, like the inside, we know this. We know Jesus is the only one strong enough to save us, to give us hope and heal us. And so what can we say this morning? The message is Christ, Christ the cornerstone. The need is tremendous and urgent, and the time is now. So may the Lord bless you, his chosen people here at Zion Lutheran Church, as you go about this task, as you yourselves today and every day, you celebrate the gospel and you celebrate Here's what, Je here's what Jesus did for me. But then you say, I don't just keep that to myself. I'm going to carry it forth. And I'm going to share it wherever I get the chance. Because I'm going to tell the next generation that Jesus loves them so much. And he wants to be their savior. And he wants to be the chief cornerstone on which they can build their lives and their eternities. In the name of Jesus. Amen.